All right, so I'm, I have this computer in front of me, so I plugged into reality and remember what world I'm in here. It just, just keeps me on track. Don't worry, I'm not going to read for anything. Um, so I'm an anthropologist. I, as I mentioned before, I started off in mathematics, but in the late 1960s when there was all this effervescence in Europe and the United States, being a mathematician wasn't the thing to do with that political time. And I met a woman, Margaret Mead, anthropologist, who uh, I interacted with and eventually got me to uh, become an anthropologist. <clears throat> Then in 1974, I uh, was puzzled about the nature of human universals and thought, and I brought some people to uh, France. It was Noam Chomsky and Jean Piaget and Jacques Monod and François Jacob and Claude Lévi-Strauss. And uh, we sort of hunkered down together for a few days and discussed everything under the sun, and I came out of that realizing that my intellectual edifice had been destroyed and it was going to take me some, some time to rebuild it. So I motorcycled around for a while and <laughs> went to Afghanistan where I was going to do field work, but then the Russians invaded. So I went to Syria and then, um, <laughs> and then uh, Sadat visited um, Israel, so they kicked me out of Syria, into Lebanon, and that was the middle of the Civil War. And then I decided, well, this area of the world is something I really should study. And it turned out that that area of the world is, is the one place in the world that used nuclear weapons, the only place that have used nuclear weapons uh, since World War II. And of course, it's five of the six people who didn't sign the Non-Proliferation Agreement Nine of the six countries also come from that part of the world, the sixth being North Korea. And uh, arms races were going on and people were killing one another and I decided that in order to understand what it is to be human, that's what an anthropologist does, um, that I should study this strange behavior, strange for me. Uh, my wife, although she's from uh, the Americas, South America, she couldn't stand it anymore and said basically, well, you can let them kill one another for a while, but I'm going back to my part of the world. And so I accompanied her <clears throat> to that part of the world. And then I spent the next 20 years with the Maya, finding out how they managed to survive in the rainforest for so long on virtually nothing. Both were very important to me because um, I realized with the Maya uh, in the studies I did that they were willing to forsake their personal gain in order to protect the, their part of the rainforest, uh, despite the fact that they were subsidizing their own extinction as others were invading and taking over their lands, and they were still practicing conservation. And uh, then after 9-11, I started hanging around with would-be suicide bombers, trying to figure out what makes them function, and realized that they were devoted to a set of sacred values that they weren't willing to give up for anything, including their own lives. And so the broader question I asked myself was, how comes it that humans make their greatest exertions for ill or good, not for their own families or lives or gain, but for ideas, a transcendent moral conception of who I am and who we are? This is the privilege of absurdity to which no creature but man is subject of which Thomas Hobbes wrote in Leviathan. And I thought back <clears throat> after 9-11, I had the Hamas and I was a French, I still am, a French civil servant. And I was a scientific advisor at Jerusalem at the time and also teaching at the Hebrew University, but I had the Muslim Brotherhood and the Hamas working for me. <clears throat> um, and after 9-11, I was looking at the reaction, especially how people were treating all of these different groups. And I thought that uh, sort of I was ethically obliged to, to try to figure out why there was this hysterical reaction and try to um, infuse what I thought was a bit of reason into the whole debate about what was happening. 
So ever since then, I've been uh, embedding myself with different groups, Mujahideen groups, among others, around the world, from uh, Sulawesi, which is an island between Borneo and New Guinea, uh, all through uh, the great middle latitudes of Eurasia, most recently just last week in uh, Ripoll, which is where the young men who um, planned the uh, bombing of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona and eventually because they blew themselves up, uh, some of them went on to kill others on the Ramblas, where they uh, were planning and where they lived and why they did what they did. So that's what I do. Most recently, I've spent, we've spent, my research team has spent the last couple of years in northern Iraq on the front lines with the Islamic State, trying to figure out the response to a question that President Obama asked, which was, well, not asked, it's the speech he gave in September 2014, in which he said the greatest mistake we made was underestimating the will to fight of ISIL, the Islamic State, and overestimating that of the Iraqi army. His National Intelligence Director, James Clapper, uh, argued that that's basically what happened in Vietnam, but then they excused themselves by saying, both the president and his national director of intelligence, that will to fight is imponderable. So I brought my team to northern Iraq, to the front lines with Iraq, with ISIS, to try to show through science that will to fight is eminently ponderable that it makes a lot of sense, and that policy should be driven in part accordingly. Now, the first thing I learned when I started dealing with policymakers uh, at that level was never, ever, if you're in academia, recommend policy to a politician. Basically, their reaction is, who the hell elected you? So uh, very rapidly, I learned under tutoring from politicians <laughs> that the way to do it is simply to present policies that are current, showing they lead to absurdity, present alternate policies and say, in a way that any moron would pick the right way to go. But again, never, ever uh, telling a policymaker what they should do. That's the death knell. And one of the reasons why there's such little real interaction between academia and uh, the policy world. Another, is, of course, is just time and um, the ability to condense arguments. Uh, something I can't do when I talk because I tend to run off at the mouth, which, which I have to do when I write. Um, I remember Madeleine Albright, she was just retired as Secretary of State and she had the office next to me at the University of Michigan as a visiting professor then. And um, in her first meeting with the faculty, Everybody got up and started saying, you know, they applauded her and everything, yelling at her and saying, well, you didn't do this and you didn't read, you know, Professor whatever, Snodgrass's treatise on this and that. And she said, yes, that I, I admit that fully. And then she said to the faculty, look, I had over 150 embassies. Some of them had up to 50 sections reporting to me every day. If I was lucky, I had half a paragraph in the presidential brief in which to condense all that information. Now, you say I should have read all these things. You tell me how I could have gotten all that information, digested it, and still been policy relevant. I'm open in arms for you. And that was, for me, an eye-opener because it, it told me that the, 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 the disconnect between academia and the policy world was also how information flows. So I've also spent much, my, much of my time now trying to condense arguments for policymakers to make them actionable in ways in which they think they've come up with the ideas and are acting on their own. The second thing, I know I'm supposed to be talking about terrorism, and, but I'd rather talk about policy <laughs> right now, because I didn't talk about that before. Um, ah, all right, I'll go into that. <laughs> um, so, the Islamic State <laughs> is a classic revolution. Uh, the difference between terrorists and revolutionaries is much like the difference between a dialect and a language. The difference between a dialect and a language is whether you've got an army or not. 
The difference between terrorism and revolution is whether you win in the end or not. If you fail to win, then you're still terrorists, and if you succeed, you're revolutionaries. But ISIS is truly a revolution in the classical sense, in every sense of the word. And it functions on the basis of the same moral principles as any of these classic revolutions since the French Revolution, as Maximilien Robespierre said in his speech to the National Convention in July 1794 in Paris, terror is an emergency measure emanating from virtue in the defense of democracy. And in fact, you cannot want to harm or kill masses of people innocent of direct harm to others unless you have a deep sense of moral virtue in what you do. And this was true of the French revolutionaries. It was true of the Bolsheviks. It was true to a certain extent of the anarchists. Certainly true of the fascists and the Nazis. True of the Iranian revolution. And true of almost any revolutionary movement uh, in the world. Now, of course, it's bloody and brutal, but that's not unique to human groups or history. In fact, for the first 200,000 years of human beings' existence on Earth, with basically the same bodies and brains that they have today, uh, infanticide, oppression of minorities and women, slavery, cannibalism, and all those nice kinds of things was just run-of-the-mill. It was only in the middle of the 18th century that some European intellectuals, elites, uh, decided for the first time in human history that torments of the body were no longer to be allowed. And torture for the first time was banned in England, France, and the new United States by the end of the century. Slavery soon followed, and the other things we call human rights. But they were based, of course, on patently, empirically absurd principles. Still are. Even though the authors of those principles claim they were given by providence or nature, nothing could have been more counterintuitive and counterempirical at the time. Jefferson, in his first Declaration of Independence in the first draft, said, we hold these rights to be sacred and inalienable. It was Benjamin Franklin who introduced the term self-evident because he was a hyper-rationalist and didn't like the term uh, sacred at all. But in fact, they were new sets of sacred values, that is, moral values that are non-negotiable. And societies invariably rise and fall on the basis of their adherence to sacred values. Societies as social contracts, which has been since World War II, more or less par for the course in Europe, generally are unstable in human history for a very simple reason. Social contracts are matters of convenience. The greatest good, say, for the greatest number. And if they're matters of convenience, then there's always a better deal down the line. And if there's a better deal down the line, then by backwards induction, it's always possible to defect, and you should defect sooner rather than later. The crisis in Catalonia, for example, is a good example of what happens if one group decides to defect at whim. But societies built on religious principles and transcendental principles tend to survive because there's no exit strategy, there's no escape, you're locked into them. And this not only includes societies based on religious principles, which are patently absurd. I mean, think about it, you got a bodiless creature with a, a bodiless being um, that has all these sentient attributes and in addition can move mountains and basketballs and is omnipresent and omnipotent and omniscient. I mean, that's patently absurd. No one can actually understand that. In fact, I do experiments which show that's the case. As I just said to the kids, I have a little Johnny. He's in Wisconsin. His foot's caught in the river. He prays to God to save him as the water's rising. At the exact same moment, little Mary, she's in Australia. She falls on the railroad tracks, the rail train's coming, she prays to God to save her. What does God do? Well, no one says, wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Let's just solve the problem. They ask, well, how fast the train is coming? How many brothers and sisters would Molly have left or Johnny? You literally can't conceive of it. And so religions, religious principles are constantly reinterpreted, which is why every 
week we have imams and priests and rabbis and whatnot giving you the context of why something, which is patently absurd, means what it does in this context today, and that makes it adaptable. That means it can never be falsified. It can never be logically shown to be non-consequent, and it can never be verified. So it can be constantly reinterpreted. But the same is true of any of the transcendental isms that have defined our modern political world. When these monotheistic religions, these salvational <coughs> notions came down to earth, and instead of satisfying human <coughs> problems in the distant future, were meant to satisfy them in the immediate here and now, beginning with the French Revolution. So we had anarchism and socialism and communism and fascism and democratic liberalism and colonialism and lots of these isms, all functioning on the basis of unverifiable principles that cannot be logically falsified or verified or empirically falsified or verified, which makes them highly adaptable. And of course, each of the proponents of these isms believes that it's given by providence or nature, one or the other. Well, the Islamic State is no different in any of this. Unlike those societies built on propositions of human rights, they couldn't care less about those things, uh, but neither did humanity for most of the course of its existence. Nor do they think that the current human rights regime, which is instituted by these European intellectuals, um, has helped the world at all. Uh, they look at the Middle East and they see that all of these political systems and revolutionary ideas have been tried there. Nationalism, liberalism, communism, fascism, none of them work. So now they're looking in their own histories and trying to figure out what will work. And the Islamic State comes up with something that is appealing on very many levels. People think the Islamic State is just barbarous and cruel and they do a lot of brainwashing, and they're nihilistic. Nothing can be further from the truth. It is a joyous and festive movement that appeals to young people, from young volunteers from over 100 nations on Earth. It's exciting. It's glorious. It's cool. And it tends to thrive where conditions warrant. Ideology is often used to describe why ideas are so powerful. But ideology, as a concept, I think is worthless. Ideas exist in people's minds, and they circulate from mind to minds, and they motivate people's actions. You're here because you belong to this particular group. What is it called? The circle? <laughs> right? Full circle. Full circle. And you have some background ideas that are that make my idea somewhat congenial. Uh, you're forced here, you're in this room, and you're listening to them, so the ideas don't escape, and they circulate, and then you may circulate them among you. And so the environment is propitious for the circulation of these ideas, and perhaps their continued existence, and their propagation uh, into other minds. Uh, if I was uh, Mr. Juncker or Mr. Trump, and you were the media, of course, they would go much further. Maybe. <laughs> well, the Islamic State is basically the same. They put out ideas. But those ideas are adapted to particular audiences. And they are most contagious in particular kinds of audiences. It's not the social, if it was just social media putting out narratives, then you'd see a random recruitment pattern diffuse. Instead, it's very, very highly clustered in particular social networks, in particular towns, and in particular neighborhoods. And this is true everywhere in the world where the Islamic State has drawn in people. So what is it about these particular neighborhoods and particular social networks uh, that make these ideas so susceptible, so appealing? Well, first of all, on a general plane, the Islamic State is very much like the United States at the end of the 19th century. When Emma Lazarus wrote that poem on the, statue, on the Statue of Liberty, give me your huddled masses, your poor, your needy, the refuse of your teeming shores. Islamic State is exactly the same today. You have mental problems? Come, we got a job for you. You're slightly suicidal? We have the ideal position for you. <laughs> we can make you glorious. 
You're a petty criminal, especially if you're Muslim, 7-8% of the French are petty criminal, are, are, excuse me, are, are Muslim, but 60% of the prison population is Muslim, males, very much like blacks in South Chicago. They don't want to be criminals. Because they are because of opportunity costs. They're marginalized, discriminated against, and in their networks, it's hard to make it in the mainstream, and the pre-existing networks do foster petty crime. But the Islamic State comes along and says, you don't want to really want to be criminals. You'd rather be heroes, wouldn't you? Well, of course, that's a no-brainer. So, we've got an idea. You take the skills that were forced on you by your oppressors, use them to liberate yourselves, use them to liberate your brethren, use them to liberate the world. Now, what can be more appealing and powerful that, than that as a message? In other places, the Islamic State uses other strategies. In England, in Manchester, for example, in Manchester is a really interesting reason why in places like Manchester, one has to do with cheap charter flights. Um, the university population is susceptible. Why? Because there's a large Muslim university population and even uh, uh, many Christians who, uh, or atheists who have no, nothing uh, nothing in their previous lives that would uh, fight against what the Islamic State is trying to do with them. And what are they trying to do with them? Well, just like in the United States, when you go to university in England, there's a lot of sex and binge drinking. You've got young hormones being released with no control. Well, that's fine for most young kids. But for people from different and traditional families, it's uncomfortable. So. People will form cultural mixers. They'll have picnics. They'll play soccer together. They'll say, that really makes you uncomfortable. Why don't you hang around with your own people, feel good, do your studies in a nice environment? And then maybe there may be someone who starts to talk about politics, and someone from the Islamic State will say, or who's been there, who is a sympathetic, well, why don't you think about it this way or that way, and slowly bring these people along. For other people, I find it's very different. For example, the Islamic State, like most revolutionary groups, was founded by educated and well-off elites. Almost all terrorist groups since the anarchists of the 1870s and social revolutionaries have been founded by people with science education. In the plurality. Same is true of Al-Qaeda. And what kind of particular science education? Usually engineering and medical studies. Most all terrorist groups and revolutionaries are found by people uh, who are university educated and often in these particular scientific disciplines. Why? Because hands-on operations, they know how the world works, and yet they're willing to show delayed gratification. And then the movements become more widespread. They start bringing in people from the margins, less educated, uh, petty criminal world. In fact, they open it up to a mass movement. They become equal opportunity employers. And unlike our society, which requires considerable time and investment to advance and to find significance and purpose and meaning in careers and families and things like that, they offer the people most on the outs and the most unlikely to be able to advance in our societies almost immediate gratification. Again, you want to make something of yourself? You're a 22-year-old computer engineer? Come with us. We'll make you do great things. And in fact, it was a bunch of young 20-year-old Algerian computer engineering students who came to Mosul in, Jan in June 2014, who downloaded $430 million from the computers of the banks in Mosul when we were able to fund the Islamic State. Think about how glorious that is. I got a call from the head of the medical school in Khartoum. Her entire top class all the A students, and only the A students, decided to set up a medical clinic in Raqqa for the Islamic State. She called me to ask me what was going on. And I said, well, you've got to find out what was going on. But obviously, they wanted something more in life than just studying and living a middle class existence. So it's not just poor people, and it's not just marginal people, and it's not very smart people all the time. It spans the distribution almost of humanity. 
doesn't bring, of course, everybody in. It brings people in in particular environments. For example, you're in a community, an immigrant community that's distressed. The social bonds are broken down. You've got drug trafficking running rampant. You get a sense of community and purpose rebuilt in the Islamic State. You're a young woman, and of course, now the Islamic State needs women because it was a state building enterprise, and so one out of every three or four people, depending on the country, who joined late in 2015 and 16 were women. It was the first time in the jihadi movement, but it was also the first time they were trying to build a state. So recruitment's a function of the sort of conflict and revolutionary dynamics, not of personalities per se. And when we asked the women why they joined, some say to us, well, I can't talk to my parents. They don't even want to talk to me in Arabic. And they certainly don't want to discuss foreign affairs. And the surrounding society, they look at me with suspicion. And besides, I don't know anything about being a man or a woman anymore. It's all unclear to me. I want a woman to be a woman and a man to be a man, and I know I can be that in the Islamic State. I know I can be Arab in the Islamic State. I can have an identity in the Islamic State. That's a lot of young women say that. Other young women, they tell me they joined because Islamic State <laughs> offered them a thousand likes on Facebook. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know what a like was. <laughs> Right? But for a 16-year-old, a thousand likes on Facebook, that's something. I found out later. But that's enough to bring them in. So again, the Islamic State is, but they're not social engineering geniuses. They're not particularly apt at social media. It's true, they do look at things like Grand Theft Auto or the Nielsen ratings in the United States. And if you look at the way they build their videos, they build them off of those. They see a movie that works very well that's a top up box office attraction, or a music video, or something like Grand Theft Auto, and they'll actually construct their own propaganda around it because the work's already been done for them. They know what works. But in terms of innovation, they're not very innovative at all. In terms of their competence in social media, it's not more than a good university student. And I'm often surprised that they don't even try to have access to the kinds of access they could have. For example, Boko Haram. They have access to these Nigerian hackers who are phenomenal. ISIS never uses them, even though, well, I shouldn't put that, well, you're not going to tell ISIS about this anyway. Uh, even though uh, Boko Haram has pledged allegiance uh, to the Islamic State. So, I'm just so I'm not getting completely off track here. Ah. So we find that the most important things for the propagation of these ideas, again, is the environments. And they're not unitary environments. And the messages must fit the environments. That tells you that ideology as such is a meaningless notion. And it also tells you that notions like counter-narratives are meaningless notions especially the kinds of counter-narratives our policymakers use, which are generally mass messages that are negative and lecture at these young people rather than engage them. <coughs> so, for example, ISIS is bad, they chop off heads. Uh, you know, my response to that is, geez, didn't we know that already? <laughs> you really think that's going to stop people? And besides, if you actually pay attention to the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, you will notice that only about 3% of its tweets in social media are about punishment, and 57% of its tweets in social media are about social development programs for young people. And so riding off, for example, in Marha province in Yemen, riding piggyback off Al-Qaeda and ISIS, we were able to institute social media campaigns for young people who brought them in and they did marvelous things like clean up 500 kilometers of beaches that no one had ever done in Yemen before. But again, that was something that actually came from Al-Qaeda. But it was turned around against Al-Qaeda to actually mobilize young people around and then brought in the local sheikhs as well because the local sheikhs wouldn't come out against Al-Qaeda or ISIS because they got to live that place and Al-Qaeda could come back tomorrow and ISIS could come back tomorrow. But they were quite receptive to these kinds of things. ISIS, unlike Al-Qaeda, actually does use more direct hands-on recruitment. Al-Qaeda was very much like the European Research Council. 
it only accepted propositions from the outside. It had no recruiters. There's no such thing as an Al-Qaeda recruiter. It had a shura, and people would make proposals to Al-Qaeda. They would accept about 15 to 20 percent, like the National Science Foundation in Washington or the National Institutes of Health. In fact, the 9-11 was a proposal proposed by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was not a member of Al-Qaeda. He had a previous plot that didn't work, and he proposed to Al-Qaeda the shura, which had a split vote, and said, oh, this is a good idea, and they waited. They didn't know exactly what they were going to do, but it sounded like a good idea. And then they had these guys from Hamburg, from Harburg, in a technical university from the Middle East, got an apartment together. The neighbors told us the place stank the high heaven because they just put in mattresses and have people go through and watch videos of Palestine and Bosnia. And those four guys uh, in Hamburg, in Harburg, um, didn't know what they wanted to do. They wanted to do something, like the great Mujahideen who fought the Russians. So they decided to go to Bosnia. They got in touch with the Bosnians, which was a big thing at the time, and the Bosnians said, do you know how to fight? And they said, no, we're willing to learn. He says, well, we can't help you in that. We have our own problems. Why don't you get us some night goggles? That wasn't exciting enough, so they decided they were going to go to Chechnya. But then, actually, they tried to buy tickets, and they were told that the Russians weren't allowing people into Chechnya today. That didn't work. So then they met a guy on a train, who, because he had a big beard, and they had big beards by then, because they had been living holed up in this apartment, <laughs> not shaving. And uh, they said, well, he said, well, why don't you go to Uzbekistan or Afghanistan? Great idea. So they wound up in Karachi in Pakistan, then went to Kandahar, where Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had put in this proposal that had been accepted, say, hey, boss, look what I got. I got these four guys coming from Europe with visas to get into the United States. Actually, only three of them. Ramzi bin al-Shib, who was the guy who actually put them together, not Mohammed Atta, sort of a back-slapping, happy-go-lucky guy. He couldn't get in, so bin Laden simply decided, because Atta was the eldest, that he would be the operational commander of the group. But you see, this is one carefully, highly planned sort of thing. Now, whoops, in terms of the Islamic State, as I said, there's more recruitment. Why? Uh, I should just maybe show you, uh, since it's right here in front of me, why. Okay, this is uh, where our team was. This is northern Iraq. Can everybody see this? You just see a mud wall on a flat plain. Right? This is the jumping off point for the offensive against Mosul. This is a static line, defense line. That's, that's us embedded with uh, the Peshmerga. Um, this is a static line that goes on for 3,000 kilometers. And they defended this static line, which is larger, which enclosed a territory larger than Great Britain, governing millions of people. So unlike Al-Qaeda, they couldn't take the luxury of getting good proposals and making sure that their plots were good so that their reputation would be raised and then it would be spread, their reputation would spread their message. They had to defend this against a coalition of 70 armies. Each true had a knife in everyone else's back. Um, and so they had to draft in people. And so they took in people, anyone they could get. And the local guys, unlike the foreign volunteers, who were highly motivated for, what, for all these reasons I talked about, were much less motivated because ISIS would come in and take over their village and say, ah, you've got three sons, give us one, or we take your daughter as a bride for our troops. Well, you can imagine what that means. We interviewed some of those people. Or once we, were, we listened to the walkie-talkies, because this particular line is 800 meters from the ISIS front lines, and so we heard everything they said, even the kinds of chickens they eat, and uh, when they were setting up and moving their trucks, because it takes about four minutes to set up a, a, a sniper position, so we could look for three minutes and then know that they've moved their sniper positions and then duck. And um, 
We were listening one day, and a, a young guy, you can tell from their accents where they're from, right? A young guy says, uh, hey, my brother's just been killed uh, by the Kurds. Um, we're surrounded. Uh, can you get us out of here? And the guy responding to him was from Chechnya or Dagestan and said, oh, well, you should be happy. You'll soon be in paradise with your brother. And the kid said, well, I don't want paradise right now. Get me the hell out of here. And they said, and then the, the commander said, no, you're going to paradise. Foreign fighters generally sleep with their suicide belts on. They walk in around bodyguards without bodyguards in Mosul with their suicide belts on. But the locals are quite different. And the locals are much more likely to surrender. And when foreign fighters are captured, if at all, it's rare they're captured because they usually booby trap them bo their bodies when wounded, they're usually executed within three hours. Basically, the, uh, the Kurds or even the, the Shia uh, will simply say, oh, so you've come from Belgium to kill us? Screw you. Bam, you're dead. But locals are different because the tribes are trying to keep open contacts with one another. And so the Kurds especially, but even to an extent the Shia government, will put them on trial and try to show some semblance of fairness. Although I must say, especially among the Shia militia, it can be a very summary trial, <laughs> like lasting 30 seconds. We're now in Mosul. Uh, our research team is now in Mosul. We've been interviewing young people coming out from under ISIS uh, since the fall of Mosul. And what I can tell you is that the present generation is still thoroughly infused with the values of ISIS. Nearly everybody in the Arab Sunni heartland of Syria and Iraq embraced ISIS enthusiastically. They called it a thora the revolution. In fact, all the Sunni militia guys who are now fighting with the coalition were originally ISIS supporters, or most of them. There are a couple of exceptions that I know of. And the reason they turned against ISIS and joined the American-led coalition was because they were generally tribal elites. And ISIS, after four to six months, started doing a lot of things, killing policemen and officers and former military. And, and they started telling the people who were, dis, who were underprivileged or less privileged in the village, ah, oh, you see that sheikh over there? Look at that nice pickup truck he's got. You got nothing. Look at all the land he's got. Look at those plum trees. You got nothing. Take them. And so the ones who had their lands and pickup trucks taken came over to the coalition. But let me tell you, they have no intrinsic love of the coalition. And although they're fighting alongside the United States or even Iran, they claim the US and Iran invented ISIS for their own purposes. They truly all believe that, by the way. Um, and the young who actually joined ISIS, the ones that are captured who are locals, when we asked them why they joined, um, and our, our, our ways of asking are very different than military interrogators. I, <laughs> I can assure you, I have films of it. Um, basically, they say, look, life was hell after the American invasion. The Shia were voted into power, and all they did was kill us and ruin our lives, and we couldn't go out for months at a time, and ISIS comes along, and it's a no-brainer. It really is. And so we joined. That doesn't mean they were terribly committed. But again, the ones, the foreigners, were generally and still are generally committed. And I don't see any lessening of that commitment. But the more dangerous thing, I think, in the long term is that the young people coming out from under rule do believe that the, the strict Sharia that ISIS was preaching is the only means of salvation of their society. No one, not one person, who we've interviewed in the IDP camps of Ghazar and Dabagha, one to the east and one to the south of Mosul. Well, actually, th there are three, cam three Ghazar camps, two Dabagha, one stadium camp to the south. Um, has um, anything good to say about democracy? Zilcho, not a zip. And if you think about democracy, and you think about how it works in the Middle East when the United States came in and had a vote. 
What happens when you have a vote with no liberal institutions to back it up? It results only in a tyranny of the majority, not tolerance at all. Those who look back to ancient Athens and the, uh, and the, and the uh, origins of democracy, direct democracy, should pay attention to ancient Athens. What democracy meant in ancient Athens was the winners got to exile the losers. Liberal democracy was basically invented by the United States during the American Revolution and spread through various means in Europe, through the French Revolution in part. And what it means is tolerance of minorities and free press and legislative assembly and rights, workers' rights and all these sorts of things. And they were instituted in Europe first by Napoleon Bonaparte, who um, proclaimed tolerance of religions and by those who outlined torture and slavery and other things, and then by Napoleon III and Bismarck, who introduced legislative assemblies, allowed opposition press, however limited, equal justice before the law. There were reasons why Bismarck and Napoleon did that. The 1848 revolutions, were very much like the Arab Spring in Europe, had spread, by the way, without social media and electronics, from Sicily in January 1948, to Denmark and the Russias by March, faster than the Arab Spring, no electronic media whatsoever, and over a greater range of territory. But they were defeated, just like the Arab Spring was. And in the conservative reaction, the elites of Europe invented two things. They invented the modern nation state, where in order to avoid having the proletariat, the laborers and the peasants revolt again, brought them in, at least ideationally, into the body politic, saying, you are part of our blood and soil. That was never the case before. You are part of our blood and soil. So the notion of blood and soil, which became the foundation, for example, of nationalist and fascist and the xenophobic movement, was born in the reaction. It was very powerful because it brought them in. And it's still very powerful. In fact, it is the one antidote we're seeing to the rise of these transnational movements like the jihadi movement. The dark side of globalization is created in part by the creative destruction of market capitalism. It's a forced gamble. Europeans have adapted to the forced gamble. Europeans have adapted to national identity and to liberal institutions, to democracies. How? Well, Europe was, like most other places, confessional and tribal and family-based. But then it had an industrial revolution. So you had to get people off the land to work in factories. And the way you did that was sealing off the commons and privatizing the land, which was not the case in the peasantry of Europe. And when you privatize land and people have lots of children, the land parcels become smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And so more and more and more prone to be sold off. And soon the land was gone, basically. And people migrated, especially second and third sons, to the factories. And then you had to have some way of getting these people to work together. These are strangers. They're not tribesmen. They're not family members. They don't share any history. How are you going to get these perfect strangers to work together in factories? And not only that, to give their lives in armies to defend the people who own the factories. Well, you invent the nation, which is a godlike thing with all the properties of God. It has banners and flags and demands sacrifice and it has anthems and music and sway and bowing and all the prostrations and all the things that religious systems have. In fact, it is a religious system. It is our religious system. And this nation state system dominates the world. And since the improbable victory of the United States in World War II that dominates this world, so market capitalism aligns itself with the nation state system. Again, Europe could adapt to it. It had 200 years to adapt both to national identity in the nation state system and to the creative destruction of market capitalism. 
but the rest of the world has only had since 1945. And there you have millennial traditions that have collapsed. And so they have nothing to fall back on when this forced gamble fails, and it fails for most people. And these are the ones, by the way, who are most susceptible to the message. And I'll end with this because I see someone approaching from the background. <laughs> So I was, uh, as someone mentioned, I was at Davos in January, and I was very much taken by uh, President Xi Jinping telling us that now that the United States has gone off the deep end, China is the only grown up in the block, <laughs> and that since China has accepted globalization, it is inevitable that globalization will win out the day, but it should be done the Chinese way. <laughs> <laughs> and that all these jihadi and xenophobic ethno-nationalist blips are just atavistic blips and if you let the Chinese take care of it they'll all go away very fast. <laughs> Madame Lagarde had exactly the same position but she wanted the EU to do the micromanaging and Secretary Kerry, it was the day before he was to leave office, he said the same thing but the United States still should be trusted to take care of this. And then I was sitting in, as I said to the young people, I was sitting in a room like this, and the average wealth was 10 to 15 billion dollars among each of the people. That's uh, 10 to 50, that's uh, 1 million dollars a year for 10 to 15,000 years for every person in that room. And given that they have a lot of money, and it's really hard to spend 15 billion dollars if you think about it, um, they said, okay, we're going to give some money to poor people. And this universal income is going to end this, is going to do exactly what Madame Lagarde and Secretary Kerry and President Xi Jinping said. It's going to end this um, wave of populist and jihadi stuff. And I'm telling them, I said, guys, it's not going to happen. First of all, poor people never institute revolutions. That's just fact. And second, if you do give people enough to eat and live on and housing, but no purpose in life, they tend to be the revolutionaries. So you're actually subsidizing your own extinction, which may not be a bad thing, but it's certainly, <laughs> certainly not something you want. And then I asked them, <clears throat> ever since the defeat of fascism and communism, by the way, the fascists and communists in the 20s and 30s played off each other much as the jihadis do and the far right does today, and does the same hatchet job on the European middle classes. I said, with the defeat of fascism and communism, have our lives defaulted for the quest with comfort and safety? Is that enough to ensure the survival, much less triumph, of the values we all take for granted and believe the world is based on? More than the threat from jihadis, it is the vitality of our own values that represents the greatest existential threat that we have. Because civilizations rise and fall on the basis of cultural ideas, not material assets alone. And we cannot find in our studies a willingness of young people in our societies to sacrifice for those values. And that's something I think we should be worried about and work on. Thank you.